Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're back. We're back here, and I think after a very intense discussion that we had here with the ambassador, uh, th this is the time now where he has given us a lot of food for thought, and we will pick up on on uh, this discussion I just had with the ambassador to to continue with uh, now uh, five individuals who are very well uh, uh, positioned to comment uh, on the title, on the session that we have now titled, Kamka Geopolitics After Ukraine, What's Desirable, What's Possible? And I couldn't have asked for a better panel here. To my immediate left, of course, he was the former US ambassador to Azerbaijan, a former deputy assistant secretary of state for Europe and Eurasia, and he's also served in the White House as director for European affairs on the National Security Council staff. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador Matthew Breiser is here. Uh, also delighted uh, to have uh, with us the director uh, of the uh, Douglas and Sarah Ellison Center for Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. He also served as a former advisor to the UK Ministry uh, of Defense. Uh, Luke Coffey is here, ladies and gentlemen. She is the co-founder and COO at the international consultancy firm Blue Star Strategies. She also serves on the board of directors of the Atlantic uh, Council as a senior advisor to the Future Europe Initiative. Sally Painter, ladies and gentlemen, is here. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute where he studies Asian and Middle Eastern affairs, international security and development alternative geopolitical futures and US diplomacy and strategy. Wow, that's quite a portfolio. Eric Brown, ladies and gentlemen, is here. And uh, last but certainly not least, somebody who needs very little introduction in this network. He's uh, the director for Central Asia at the Oxford Policy Advisory Group and a former executive director of the Kazakhstan Council on International Relations, Iskandar Akalbaev, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Who, who, as always, uh, has brought his own fan club with him along. So, <laughs> Iskander, good, good to have you. Good to have everyone here on board. But on to more serious subject matters, obviously, in the remaining uh, 50 minutes, uh, 55 minutes that we have here. Ambassador Bryder, you just heard Ambassador Bolton speak uh, about Ukraine, about a possible ending. What would a victory really mean uh, for Ukraine or Russia? Uh, for that matter. You are very uh, well positioned also to comment on that because you know the region uh, very uh, well. Um, how, how do you assess the very, very current situation that we're in right now? It seems to be touch and go, a little bit back and forth. The Russians seem to be making some headway. Uh, very hard to predict. Uh, well, the situation is, you know, it is fluid, as you say, but it's, you know, it's a bit more grim now. I mean, the U.S. has provided, what, around 5,500 Javelin missiles, which have played such a game-changing role in taking out Russian tanks, but those are not unlimited. Uh, the US manufactures them, but they're, they are limited and they're not easy to operate. I was even listening to a Washington Post uh, podcast this morning about how there's a, a technical helpline that you can call in from the battlefield if the software fails. And can you imagine, like, you, know, you, you get an error message saying bracketed whatever <laughs> and you're trying to hit a Russian tank. So this is really complicated. Um, and the Russians are following, as we all know, the same approach they did in Grozny, the same approach uh, in Syria, which is grind, pulverize, kill civilians, target hospitals, uh, and, and they can do that. They can destroy, the, the, the trick is to, is to create something. So where it might all go, I, I think the outlines of what could be uh, an outcome, a negotiated outcome down the road, uh, came out of the talks uh, uh, in late March in Turkey. I mean, Turkey, the Turkish government really wants to play the role of peacemaker for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and we can go into Turkey and Russia, et cetera. But the outlines came, came through, which was that uh, Russia would pull back from February 24th from where it invaded. Ukraine would declare its neutra neutrality and readiness not to join NATO. And then the status of Donbass and Crimea would be determined 15 years hence, which is exactly how we tried to work on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict as well. If you can't resolve the status question today, Postpone it, use constructive ambiguity as your friend, and achieve results on the ground that save lives and prevent uh, further destabilization. Yeah, the, the question, of course, uh, we are here to address uh, on this panel is how this war will affect, has affected 
the Kamka uh, region, what's desirable, what's possible, uh, really, Luca, what is your current assessment here? Uh, well, first, uh, I want to thank Comca for inviting me to speak at this event. It's uh, great that it's here in Washington this year, so it was very easy to hop in an Uber and, and come down here. But, um, and, and Ali, thanks for that question. Of course, uh, the region, um, as it pertains to the economic activity, the energy flows, the commerce and transit, is very interconnected. So there are knock-on effects to what we're seeing happening with international sanctions against Russia, uh, and with what's happening in Ukraine impacting uh, the region. But I think, uh, you know, the title of, the, um, of, of this discussion is what's, what's possible and what's, what's feasible, or what's desirable and, and what's, what's feasible. I would say we have to, um, we have to start thinking like um, everything has to be, what's desirable has to be feasible. You know, we, we need to get on the front foot with U.S. engagement um, in this region, in the South Caucasus, in Central Asia. Uh, the, the war in Ukraine offers uh, you know, many challenges for the region, but also some opportunities for renewed U.S. engagement, especially when you uh, factor in other geopolitical challenges, such as the situation in Afghanistan, but also with, with China. Uh, so I would say the, the first thing the U.S. needs to do in this region is show up. Right? It's now been a decade since a cabinet level secretary has visited the South Caucasus. Of course, Ambassador Bolton visited as national security advisor, but it was Secretary of State Hillary Clinton that was the last one to show up to all three countries in the South Caucasus. Uh, it was two years ago since Pompeo visited as Secretary of State Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, but before that it was you know, five years before him that John Kerry visited this region. There's been no setting U.S. president that has visited Central Asia. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time we just show up and demonstrate our willingness to have an enduring long-term relationship with these countries at a pace they're comfortable with so we can build uh, and deepen uh, our, our relationships in the region. The U.S. needs to show up, show face in yeah. the region, make its weight and influence known, says uh, Luke Sally. Is that something you would concur with? Definitely. Um, you know, I, think, I just got back from the region. I was in uh, Warsaw and meeting with my team who was based in Kiev and is now uh, out, out placed into um, to Warsaw. But... Uh, you know, I think, uh, sorry, Sally, I, just making sure that everybody's hearing you, the microphone, I think, w w w is it on? It's not, it's not working. No worries, we'll, we'll, we'll figure can, it out. I can talk loudly. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and I think, you know, going, I was uh, asked to talk a little bit about the European perspective. Here, yes. And um, I think it's, it was unprecedented what President Biden was able to do to have the unity and support for Ukraine in Europe. Uh, and with NATO. So, um, hi. <laughs> Thank you. And so, but I, I feel that cohesion is really at risk um, because we're seeing a grinding war of attrition. Um, and we've got some weaknesses within the alliance, uh, notwithstanding what Poland and, and um, uh, Hungary are thinking about. But there's negative consequences that are going to hit Europe. Um, we've got uh, inflation up 8.8%. Um, there's a potential recession. Um, the f global food supply is, could uh, jeopardize that. And then we've got the energy prices. You know, allies like the Baltics are, are really feeling this today. Uh, and if the supply continues to decrease and the price goes up, my concern is that uh, unity is, is really going to falter. And that's where, again, I think the U.S. really, to Luke's point, needs to step up continue to lead and look at solutions uh, that we can all work together on. And the unity is, as you correctly pointed out, is already cracking within the European Union. Hungary not going along with the full oil embargo uh, on uh, Russia and the NATO summit next uh, week in Madrid. Uh, we'll have to see how that one plays out. Uh, Eric, uh, also let's, let's bring you in here and get your assessment uh, about um, the, the war in Ukraine, obviously, that is uh, keeping our attention, catching our attention, but uh, primarily also how it affects the Kamka region. Yeah, um, well, thank you, Ali, and thank you to the, the organizers. It's uh, great to be here to honor and remember Secretary Rumsfeld and to see a lot of old friends as well. Um, I was asked to say a little something about Asia. Yes. Uh, of course, in Asia, everybody's paying a lot of attention to what's going on in Europe and trying to figure out how these developments in Europe affect their own security. 
Uh, when you speak to Taiwanese or Japanese or others, their primary concern, of course, is PRC's ambitions, China's ambitions, and they're seeing uh, Taiwan as being very much in a similar situation that Ukraine was and other countries uh, were in. Of course, um, what they're worried about is that China uh, will uh, also um, uh, launch a military and other form of operation to de facto attempt to destroy the national civilization that has emerged within Taiwan. I have a colleague uh, at the Institute named Chris Demuth who I think has aptly uh, uh, phrased this as being nation-side. Uh, the, the war in Ukraine and also what PRC would like to do, not just in Taiwan, but in other emerging national cultures within the PRC empire. And that includes Tibet and Xinjiang, as well as Hong Kong. Uh, and what we're seeing now, um, uh, in a, or I think in a much larger scale right now, are these large Eurasian behemoths, including Russia, uh, China, and latterly some other uh, aspiring empires on the Eurasian continent that are attempting to assert themselves and to roll back the order of sovereign nations that has mushroomed since 1991. This they see as being essential to their political security and to everything that they'd like to achieve in the 21st century. So there is a, a profound sense of nervousness and insecurity uh, in East Asia especially. I think larger scale, what you're, being, what you're beginning to see are a number of different fissures. Sally, I think, is exactly right. There are some nascent uh, cracks in the Western alliance, um, uh, which Vladimir Putin will try to take advantage of going forward. I think the challenge for the United States, and I think that there's a lot of thinking going on about this, both on the political left and the right here, is how to internationalize the NATO alliance and to properly join the NATO alliance with the maritime democracies of East Asia. That, I believe, is the fundamental challenge that the US is facing with our Asian allies and partners. And I expect much, much more work to, do, to be done on that front. But larger scale, I think what you're beginning to see when you look at the fissures that begin to emerge across Eurasia is the emergence of a sort of a mega fault line uh, that's happening between the world's maritime-oriented democracies and these large Eurasian states on the Eurasian landmass. And that has uh, immense implications for CAMCO, which I look forward to speaking about. In, indeed, many implications uh, for the region. One country, of course, in particular, Iskandar Kazakhstan, is, has come up during the discussion with Ambassador uh, Bolton, uh, clearly a country that is feeling uh, the impacts, uh, the effects of the war in, in Ukraine has its own uprising, to, had to deal with its own uprising at the beginning uh, of this year. G give, us, give us the sense of what is the mood uh, in Nur Sultan right now. Well, if, if you are talking about uh, specifically the, the Kazakhstan, the domestic politics, certainly. I, I think the microphone again. Well, well, it's all right. We'll. Uh, Get used to that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. We'll, Actually, we'll, I think no. I'll try again. I think it, yeah. it's it's now working. Try, try it. Try it. For does it work? Yes, yes. it does. Just, just Very good. It okay. It, ta it ta takes a little while, but yes. it's it's all good. Uh, Go ahead. Well, when you speak about the, the internal dynamics in Kazakhstan, certainly uh, nobody expects that after 30 years uh, of the successful actually uh, regional development, Kazakhstan has faced one of its kind of greatest challenges of its uh, independence. So uh, certainly uh, the economic problems were the triggers for the, the, the protests and the social uprising because the social contract and the social dynamics in Kazakhstan has changed dramatically. Demography has changed dramatically. Expectations from the society towards the government uh, has changed a lot. So um, you cannot work with the uh, old tactics to satisfy the demands of new and growing society. So in this respect, I think it's nowadays Kazakhstan is trying to pass. And you mentioned about referendum and all the, the initiatives uh, President Tokayev has uh, stated, like New Kazakhstan, etc. But at the same time, it's very important to understand that we, uh, the papers and the official documents can be written very well, but the implementation process is very much important in this respect. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, we need to take a time not to enter into the euphoria that everything's going to be all right. We need to accept the mistakes and move forward. Speaking about the Ukraine crisis, Uh, speaking about specifically about Ukraine crisis, we need to understand that Kazakhstan has a one of the longest borders with Russia, and we have a historic and cultural ties with Ukraine. And uh, it was a really tough uh, question uh, on a diplomatic side as well, how to uh, 
mitigate and uh, uh, be flexible in answering the demands from the Russian side and the Western kind of pressure, uh, the fear of sanctions, possible sanctions can, that can be applied for those countries that can support Russia in their endeavors in the Ukraine territory. So uh, uh, we can, from why, what I read is that Kazakhstan has been trying to be smart on the foreign policy front, like just recently, and it comes to the Central Asian countries as well. On 24th of March, there was a UN, uh, uh, UN General Assembly resolution on the condemning uh, kind of Russia invasion into the Ukraine, etc. So uh, all the Central Asian countries abstained from voting, and it's uh, even abstaining from the voting, it means uh, that we have our own opinion on that, and we need to, need to understand that it's not easy for Central Asian countries to kind of vote uh, like back, black or white in this res respect. Uh, the economies, for example, of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are quite dependent on the uh, remittance from Russia. Uh, the internal debt uh, is very much linked to the, the Chinese, Chinese loans, etc. So in this reality, the Central Asian countries try to do their best to kind of not to offend anyone, but we mm -hmm. certainly understand that we are like small countries and medium countries, and we need to find our own formula how to survive in this big struggle, a big power struggle. Quite a delicate situation, Matthew, indeed, that the Central Asian countries are finding themselves in. Iskander just laid it out, the close historical and cultural ties, the economic uh, interlinks uh, between those countries, uh, migrant workers uh, exchanging between one country uh, and uh, another. As, as a former U.S. ambassador, how should Washington position itself here? Uh, in particular, Luke has already said we need to show up. That's one thing. But uh, beyond that, what would be your advice? Well, one key thing is to keep in mind that now is the opportunity for all the transport corridors. And this kind of, perhaps you can pass on the hand mic. Uh, we'll, we'll just do it this way, just to be sure. on the safe side. And you're yeah. still in control of the mic. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, now is a, a great opportunity to pursue what Dr. Starr was talking about in the beginning, these multiple transport corridors that restore connectivity between North and South. I mean, here in Washington for decades, since, since September 11th, 2001, our goal had been to try to facilitate east-west transit. And again, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Those routes are, are completely, not completely, they, they're blocked by too much traffic and not enough capacity right now. And so north-south routes are, are the ones that can really help then unlock the, the agricultural production, Kazakhstan's wheat, for example, and energy, and start to get at the problem of, of inflation here in the United States and the global economy. But there needs to be a convener. There needs to be an organizer. And the United States was that organizer for the original east-west transit routes. I don't mean back in the days of the Silk Road, but I mean <laughs> the Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline, the South Caucasus gas pipeline, what became for the EU the Southern Corridor. It was the US that was the convener together with Turkey. Uh, and, and we worked together with the companies and the countries to help them hammer out agreements uh, that led to investments. And there are people even in the audience here today who are doing the same thing on the commercial side. So there needs to be uh, vision by the United States working with investors to get, I think, these alternative transport routes, not even alternative, they've been on the books for a long time, but they can both integrate the Central Asian states on the eastern side of the Caspian with the ports to the south uh, in India, uh, and then provide a strategic sort of, 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 of glue to hold the countries together. Look, picking up uh, of, from, from where you left <laughs> off, saying that the US should uh, mu must reassert itself, or assert itself rather, in, in the, the region. Obviously, something like the Kamka Regional Forum is a tool to do that. Uh, what, what more could be done be, beyond that? How do you arouse, for lack of a better term, the interest on the part of uh, Americans, and particularly those making policy decisions? Yeah, uh, of course, and to follow on what, what Matt was saying about the transit corridors, um, specifically foca focusing on, on energy right now, I mean, look at Europe's situation. They're desperate to find new markets, for, especially for natural gas. Um, there are countries in the region that are desperate to diversify their, their exports, their markets. Um, if the United States right now showed half the amount of enthusiasm that the Clinton administration showed on, let's say, BTC. If we would show this today on, let's say, a Trans-Caspian gas pipeline, that could really help unlock Europe's energy crisis as it pertains to natural gas. You know, Turkmenistan's large natural reserves getting into the southern gas corridor where there is capacity and into the heart of Europe could be part of a game-changing strategy for Europe, not only making it more energy independent, but also helping it meet uh, carbon emissions targets. 
using more natural gas. And of course, there's this challenge with Iran and Russia being Caspian literal states that don't want this, this interconnector to happen. But Russia has never been more distracted than it is now, and Iran uh, almost as well, with no prospect of a new Iran deal in Vienna happening anytime soon. Uh, domestic uprisings uh, amongst the Arab minorities, the Azerbaijani minority being uh, restless as well, the Baluchi minority being restless as well. Uh, there's a lot of internal problems that President Raisi is facing. So let's pick energy, or let's think more strategic. Let's get um, a new Central Asia strategy. You know, the, the last one was published by the Trump administration, which if in reality it was an Afghan strategy focused on Central Asia. You know, out of the, the seven or so main top lines out of that strategy, five directly dealt with or indirectly dealt with Afghanistan. Or let's take the United uh, America's number one platform of engagement in the region, the C5 plus one, and let's make it a C5 plus two, throw in Azerbaijan, and then diplomatically link both sides of the Caspian together to figure out ways we can help unlock some of this uh, trade and, and commerce that Matt was talking about. I'm sure there's going to be some uh, questions or feedback on that from the audience. I'll bring them in in just a moment. But uh, Sally, we, we've talked in length uh, during this discussion about the lack of attention, lack of vision, whatever you want to call it on the part of Washington when it comes to the Kamka region. Europe, uh, does Europe fare better in this regard? I think it's very mixed. I mean, those that are on the border states, countries like the Balts and Poland and Slovakia, um, are very engaged and they're doing their part. I mean, I think there are four million uh, displaced people in Poland today. Um, I think the country that we need to be working closer with is Turkey. Turkey has got to be a part of the solution. Um, and then we've got two countries who are desperate to get into NATO now, Sweden and Finland. Um, we can't let uh, Turkey be the problem here. And I think we need to be tough, but we need to engage them in a way um, that they want to be a part of the solution. I don't know what they want to get out of the, the deal. They haven't said. Uh, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with NATO, but it may have to do something with non-associate membership, but full membership in the EU. So I think each country is, uh, is individual, but we have to focus on supporting those that are really doing their part. Turkey, you mentioned obviously a key role. Uh, uh, Matthew, something that you can say a thing or two about since you are based pri or, or semi-based uh, exactly. in Turkey. Perhaps a word on Turkey before we move on and, and bring in Luke and Iskander so sure. that, that we don't uh, uh, mix up too many, sure. too many issues here at the Thanks, same Sally. time. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, Sally, uh, well, I totally agree. Turkey needs to be part of the solution. And I think Turkey is articulating what it wants and is giving ground. Uh, what Turkey wants is to be heard on its concerns, uh, to say the least, about the PKK, the terrorist organization, which is recognized by all of the EU uh, uh, and the US, and therefore the governments of Sweden and Finland as a terrorist organization. So they're asking for some sort of progress. Uh, a couple weeks ago, when President Erdogan first said Turkey is going to uh, block Swedish and Finnish <coughs> membership unless he was more specific. He was saying there need to be extraditions of terrorist suspects from the PKK, from its affiliate in Syria, the YPG, from the FETO, the so-called Gulenist terrorist organization, and the um, restrictions uh, or sanctions on arms uh, exports uh, regarding Turkey had to be lifted. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last few days, it's, it's more vague. And uh, what's coming out of Turkey is there needs to be continued recognition by Sweden and Finland that they need to uh, stop supporting terrorists. So I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. I think it's moving in the right direction. My last comment is Ankara knows how important it is to enlarge NATO. Turkey is one of the staunchest supporters of NATO enlargement. It always has been for Georgia, Mr. Sumbadze, dear friend, for Ukraine as well. Uh, so Turkey's not going to be the one to, to blame it in the end of the day. They just want to be heard. And they're in the bazaar now negotiating. And, and the, the bazaar will be transformed to Madrid next week when the NATO <laughs> summit uh, will take place. Luke, uh, a word on, a, 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 I'm sorry, Eric. I'm sorry, uh, Eric, I'm going to come to you uh, in just I'm a moment. But Eric, uh, Asia, Asia, obviously, uh, you, your forte, we talked about the, the U.S. Uh, role or lack of role in the region, Europe, uh, the same. Asia, of course, is hard to define. It's a big, big, big continent, many countries. But how do you see the interplay here? Yeah, well, to narrow that 
large question down, we could say something about the trans-Eurasian corridors that we were talking about. I yeah. agree with Luke and everybody here, the United States needs to show up. I think there was some hope before the invasion of Ukraine that the US would be doing that in conjunction with the European Union. Of course, that failed to materialize, I think partly because of a failure of leadership here in the United States and certainly a, leader, a failure of leadership in Europe. Uh, but an interesting thing is to ask this question about, well, what are the proper ways to conceptualize trans-Eurasian uh, connectivity? Um, uh, uh, when you look at that issue from the perspective of Beijing, um, there's at least three major arteries that run across Eurasia. One goes through the north, through Russia, and deep into the heart of Germany. Another is the famous middle corridor that goes directly through Kamka and, and, uh, and, and, and into Turkey and, and by extension into the Mediterranean. And then there's the southern corridor that, that essentially moves down through uh, uh, Pakistan and, 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 and into the Persian Gulf. And what's interesting is that when you look at how Chinese strategists sort of conceptualize these three corridors, they, they tend to reflect um, uh, internal differences within uh, the Chinese Communist Party and within the Chinese strat strategic community writ large. Those who favor the northern route are clearly interested in securing their back doors, as they would put it, on the Eurasian landmass in preparation for a, to, to become what Xi Jinping has referred to as a true maritime power. And I think that that basically was what Xi Jinping's calculation was back in the Olympics. He wanted Vladimir Putin to go, and Xi Jinping's government continues to support Vladimir Putin because this is good for PRC's ambitions in the South China Sea. What's very, very fascinating about this, however, is that, and the Chinese Communist Party is notoriously disciplined and tight-lipped when it comes to what their internal agreements are, disagreements are, but one thing that you have seen has been a sort of a revitalization of, of the discussion in China about among those who favor the middle corridor, um, building out through Kamka, this as many Chinese would understand it, is the path of leaf resistance. Um, uh, it certainly doesn't put the PRC in a position uh, where it's in a, in a necessarily antagonistic relationship with the United States. It puts PRC in a position where it becomes less dependent on Russia for trans-Eurasian connectivity. Um, and I tend to think that people who are frustrated with Xi Jinping's rule uh, are, are far more in favor of this. I, I would draw everybody's attention to statements that Wang Jisi and others have made. Um, we're going to see how this evolves in the future. Um, I would worry, however, that as PRC begins to build out connectivity in the middle corridor through Kamka, it will bring with it uh, technology, it will bring with it economic investments, it will bring with it a whole range of other things which will entrench its power in Central Asia in ways that could be quite threatening to the long-term sovereignty of the region, which we'll have plenty of time to speak about. I know these issues are all very familiar to you. In the middle corridor, Turkey is the key and consequential player, for sure. China has already identified it as a key bookend to the middle corridor BRI. I myself would like to see the United States uh, work as closely as we can with India to try to build some kind of northern connectivity through India. I think India has tremendous potential. It's a long shot, but I'm, sli I'm slightly bullish on the US-India relationship, and I would like to see greater collab collaboration between the US, the maritime democracies of East Asia, and India as India strives to establish some of its own independent connectivity in the heart of Eurasia. In the, in the final uh, 20, 25 minutes uh, that we have, obviously, I'm going to open up now. So please be ready uh, with your question, Iskander. Before we do, however, uh, as somebody who is from the region, uh, we, we, we heard the uh, view from Washington, the view from Brussels, uh, uh, the view, uh, you know, if you will, from, from Asia, Beijing in particular. I saw you take diligent notes. I want to give you the opportunity <laughs> to... to uh, to, to address those, and then I'm going to come to you and bring in your questions. Thank you. And this time, please, uh, microphone, uh, whoever has the microphone, <laughs> close eye contact with me. Go ahead. Um, I will try. Uh, I, will, I will be brief. Uh, specifically, if you look from Kazakhstan, I mean, um, on the broader scale, from Central Asia region, uh, there was a big question like, uh, 
are we uh, being guaranteed our security? Like looking at the Ukraine crisis, uh, there was a Budapest agreement before, etc. Like Kazakhstan was like dropped down its nuclear weapons, etc. So there was a big question like uh, during the f 2014 whether uh, the guarantors, uh, those big powers, can uh, kind of abide by the, what they sa say it at that time. But it seemed that uh, it's not very easy for them as well. So we need to not wait for U.S. to show up, but actually in the Central Asia region or in the Caucasus or Kamka region in general sense. I, I think it's a very important time just to start building our own kind of cooperation mechanisms on the business level, on the education level, like it, um, uh, people to people exchange on the political level. I mean, it's very much uh, kind of a big brother stuff when you, we would like to uh, another country to show up and help us and guide us. I think we, uh, we ha certainly have a drawbacks and mistakes in our implementation process and the policies, but I, I think we are mature enough at least to start the negotiation. That's why we have in Central Asia this consultative meeting of the head of states, and I think it's certainly, a, it, it's more symbolic uh, negoti like a, a talks and a negotiations, but at least it gives some positive signals to the region. Uh, secondly, uh, if you take the, the Asia perspective, I think it's very important. I just I spent one year in Singapore and uh, I came during the time when the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan and the, the, the next uh, kind of once uh, uh, Kamala Harris came to Singapore and then Vietnam, etc. And uh, in Singapore, people were asking question whether U.S. Uh, looking at the U.S. activity in Afghanistan, can we say that U.S. will not withdraw uh, its troops or its support from Singapore or in a Asian democracies, yeah? Uh, and there is a doubt, and I think it's uh, U.S. at some point, if you look at foreign policy, you need to kind of double check its approach as well. Clearly uh, well noted, the region should create its own fate, own narrative, rather than waiting uh, for a quote-unquote savior or, 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 or a voice from outside. Clearly well noted. Uh, first question, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. I've been here by one of the but I work for Oxford Institute for Energy Science, which is affiliated with the so I have, a, I have two questions and this interrelated question. So, you know, the world uh, never faced the challenge of uh, getting um, a rid of fossil fuels so urgently and the challenge of supply of fossil fuels so urgently. So, you know, the world market, especially the European market, is facing uh, three major challenges and it's, you know, energy transition, uh, supply security and market volatility given this, you know, high price. Uh, you know, pressure and demand destruction in many European uh, countries, uh, but also uh, in the US as well. So, uh, in the back and against the backdrop of all these developments, you know, the role of countries like Azerbaijan, which has enormous potential of uh, natural gas, I mean, Azerbaijan uh, is you know, already exporting some 10, 11 BCM of gas to Europe, uh, but when those con con contracts were signed, back in 2013, Europe was not so desperate to get gas uh, from alternative sources as it's now. Now, you, uh, especially those countries where the gas flows, like, uh, you know, countries like uh, Bulgaria, which stopped importing gas from Russia, desperate to get additional balance of gas, and Azerbaijan has enormous potential to uh, double its export, and, and, and mm. the, the strategic role of, of countries like Azerbaijan and Central Asia, Turkmenistan, that could export uh, more gas to a Europe where Azerbaijan is, is growing. And here, uh, Turkey's role uh, is very uh, vital as well, because Turkey here uh, can play not only uh, a crucial role as a transit country, but uh, Turkey's you know, infrastructure, you know, gas receiving infrastructure, LNG, uh, uh, receiving terminals capacity is enormous and it's, uh, you know, uh, some, some European companies have already signed some contracts with Turkey to get LNG from the US at the Turkish terminals and uh, take it to the market. So, uh, the role of these countries is growing and uh, 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 it's very interesting to know the view from Washington. Uh, yes, Washington, uh, we had support of the US back, uh, back in 2000. Uh, 13 when all, all these contracts were signed, but um, that was more kind of strategic and political backing. So what about uh, these days? Do you think that uh, in the uh, position of the U.S. can change and U.S. can be more active again in the background, uh, back against the backdrop of these old developments, or do you think that uh, U.S. is more you know, interested in pursuing its you know, uh, export of LNG to Europe, uh, European countries, so maybe maybe you could say 
Yeah, thank you indeed. As a former ambassador to Azerbaijan, you seem predestined, and, and perhaps also Luke, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Kulmita. Yeah, and for uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm involved in exactly what you're talking about. So I'm on the board of a Bulgarian private natural gas distribution company and a copper mine that are both desperately trying to get that, some of that gas from the Caspian on a commercial basis. Uh, and of course, Turkey is, is a critical transit country for the US LNG coming in. Um, the key is going to be to get gas from Turkmenistan, though, because there simply isn't significant Azerbaijani gas available until maybe 2027 to, to add to the volumes going to Europe. So uh, we're at a moment now where the diplomacy is really heating up, as you've seen, right, between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan, including about moving Turkmenistani gas across Iran and then into Azerbaijan and Turkey and onward to Europe. So the whole question of the JCPOA and U.S.-Iran relations are kind of at the center of, of all of this. If the, if, the US, if the Biden administration continues to acquiesce and maybe even support those sorts of movements across Iran of Turkmenistani gas, then we can see some big developments. But if the JCPOA crashes and burns again, then I think we'll see pressure on Iran and it'll be more difficult to move that gas. I think, so that's, I think, what Washington's view is. Also, we do know that Washington's diplomacy has been active. I mean, Energy Envoy Amos Hochstein has spent time looking in, in Azerbaijan and beyond. The EU has made missions to Azerbaijan as well. But the trick is, Where's the gas, or where's the beef, as the old commercial for Wendy's used to be? No, Luke, you want to add a couple of yeah, sentences? Yes, if I may. On the point Matt was just making about um, possible uh, gas from Turkmenistan going through Iran into Azerbaijan and on to Europe, uh, I think we've seen a, a very good track record um, in the past two U.S. administrations on carving out strategic waivers. The Chabahar port in Iran was a good example where the, you know, the Trump administration uh, issued a waiver so India could continue to invest in that Chabahar port so it could eventually connect to Herat as a way to help Afghanistan reach the outside world. So where pragmatism is needed, we have seen it in the past. So that's, I'm optimistic about possible gas swaps like this. But Europe really needs to wake up. I was talking about what, what the US uh, needs to do in the region. The last European Union strategy on Central Asia from 2019 runs about 40 pages long. If you open up a PDF document of that and you hit control F and type in the words oil or gas, they are literally not found wow. in the European Union Central Asia strategy. Yet there were six references to sustainable and renewable <laughs> energies, right? So yes, we need the sustainable energy, we need the renewable energy, but especially right now, Europeans, especially in the East, need to stay warm in the winter. They need to be able to cook year-round, and kids need to be able to go to school, and the lights need to stay on. So I think uh, Europeans need to start showing up to these capitals in the region uh, with ink pens to start signing contracts because this oil and gas just doesn't magically appear out of the ground with no cost, and it doesn't magically transport itself to Europe. I think Europeans also need to get serious about this as well. Sally, I think that's something that you would agree with. 100%. Uh, you know, we've got this short-term need for fossil fuel, and we need a long-term decarbonization plan, but it takes a long time. Yeah. And each country has to develop it, and it can't just be the way the Hungarians are going either. To, to do justice by everyone, can I see a show of hands how many questions we have? <coughs> so so I'm, I'm sure one, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's do a round of three. Perhaps uh, we'll, we'll take notes and then uh, make sure we get it all in before we wrap up. Please introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, thank you so much and sorry for monopolizing the microphone. My name is Sobir Kurbanov. I'm program officer with the Center for International Private Enterprise. We work with the markets and democracy in Central Asia as well. So my question is about the, the war in Ukraine. You spoke a lot about the risks and the um, implication in terms of physical connectivity, energy, so what about the soft opportunities? Uh, we, we see the Russian kind of reduced economic footprint in Central Asia and Caucasus uh, all over the region. Where are these opportunities to kind of enhance the reforms to promote uh, a, a less dependency of Central Asia on Russia, on export of labor and energy, and where are there opportunities to bring this kind of good investments from the US to promote the greater standards of markets and democracy to empower private sector to promote less captured and more inclusive economic model that would eventually put this region on the path of, of kind of a, a greater democratic development and less dependency on Russia. And I think that in the view of all these kind of developments in the war in Ukraine, there are some unique opportunities we need all collectively to think about because we have a, a great room of experts, economists, 
uh, the private sector entrepreneurs, SMEs in this room who would, who would be our partner potentially towards this kind of exploring these opportunities. Thank you. The, thank you. Uh, I would kindly ask the panelists to obviously take notes because we're, we're doing the rounds. Go ahead, please introduce yourself. The microphone is coming around. Everybody will get in here. Asad Zameer from Afghanistan. Uh, um, we heard ambassadors and also ambassadors that talk about the, um, the lack of leadership from the U.S. not in preventing the war in Ukraine. Uh, do you think uh, it was a kind of <coughs> strategy uh, in order to achieve uh, at least two objectives among many others. One is to gauge the military power of the Russian to see what they are capable of. And second, as the U.S. has been losing influence and leadership in the U European Union. And this has actually brought closer uh, and the increased influence of the U.S. with the European Union. So, the really, the winner I see here is the U.S. Um, <laughs> And so was that calculated? What do you think, what would be uh, uh, the, yeah. from your perspective? Yeah. Uh, is that naive leadership or a calculated part? Interesting argument that the US is the winner here. We'll see if, <laughs> if, if, if the panel uh, will agree. I'm, I'm getting this, yes, please. Let, let's bring them all in because what we're gonna do is, please take notes, we'll do a final round and each of you will address the question that pertains to your field and expertise. Please go ahead. Hi. My name is Mangu, I'm uh, from Tajikistan, now living <coughs> in the US. One of the interesting trends was that uh, um, recently, the exchange rate of US dollar in Tajikistan started to, win, to go down. Why? Uh, because uh, the government, as part of anti-crisis plan, issued an instruction for all Tajik importers from Russia to do their deals only in Russian group. And we know that Putin has uh, demanded that uh, Russian gas is sold for ruble. And in this way, uh, we can see that more and more countries, the economies, are starting to trade between each other, at least on a small scale, in the national currency, and taking US dollar out of question at all. Plus, there are some uh, experts who are saying that by um, uh, lacking the uh, currency reserves of Russian central bank, U.S. started to weaponize its currency. So, uh, what do you think uh, will be the consequences of the current situation on the position of U.S. dollar in the world and the economic dominance of the U.S.? Thank you so much. Uh, this gentleman here, if you haven't raised your hand up until now, please don't do so at this particular point because uh, we're, we're uh, running out of time. Uh, my name is Emil, I'm, I'm a networker from Azerbaijan, who's worked in state owned company for a long time. Um, and you are my for deep and nice analysis on what's going on now. Well, I have a very easy question, to be honest. Uh, but we hear a very nice solution to what's happening. It's all about energy, we all understand that. With energy flow, prices are going up. Country that otherwise are not profiting because the prices are nice. But apart from giving a nice solution, so it's a UK nice solution what's happening. This trans Caspian pipeline connecting Central Asia to uh, the rest of the world, this flow of energy all down. And, but okay, what is, what is your humble opinion what's going to happen? Great hope. I mean, this is a nice analysis. Humble or I not so humble? It doesn't have to be humble. I mean. <laughs> so tell me what, 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 what you see the best case scenario and worst case scenario is going to have from your analysis. The rest are nice solutions. Right. No. Whether it's humble or not, I'll leave that up to you. If you promise to be short, I know you've had your hand up. If you, uh, nice. Please, please uh, squeeze in your question in, in 30 seconds or less. Um, I'm from the American Foreign, I'm an intern at the American Foreign Policy Council. I guess my question is, when it comes towards integrating more sort of civil society, more institutions and democratic reforms within the Canberra region, especially Central Asia, how would you propose to do that without giving sort of fuel to sort of more grassroots sort of Islamist movements within the area, without giving them sort of a voice as well in those sort of a more freer society in that sense? Thank you so much. Uh, why potpourri of, of questions, wow. of regions? Uh, could, this panel is well equipped to address those. Uh, Matthew, let's start with you and then go, go down the ranks. Okay, sure. Um, the question about uh, did, is the U.S. Uh, the mastermind of a diabolical plan to benefit from the war in Ukraine? No, absolutely not. I mean, the Biden administration never wanted this war. It tried to deter it in a way that maybe wasn't sufficient, according to Ambassador Bolton, but by leaking intelligence as to what Vladimir Putin was planning to do. Uh, and if you, you know, the, the proof to me is that 
This war is a disaster for the Democratic Party when the uh, midterm elections are approaching because one of the primary causes of inflation being so high is the war in Ukraine, the cutoff in grain supplies from Ukraine and, and energy, Russian energy taken out of the market. Uh, and this is the number one, number two, number three biggest political issue in the US, inflation. Uh, and so Joe Biden's personal political survival uh, is, is depending on this, and it's, it's getting endangered by the war in Ukraine. Um, what's going to happen? Uh, I mean, you, you, we've known each other a long time, you tell me. I, I, I unfortunately agree, though, with Ambassador Bolton that um, this war is going to grind down for a long time. And the, the east-west transit routes we've been promoting all these years, and as you said, Caspian Pipeline, uh, um, th those are not sufficient. Uh, as we were talking about last night with a couple of my friends here uh, at, at the forum, it now takes three months to move a container from the east side of the Caspian to, to the Black Sea. Three months. That should just take a few days, but it's because of all the supply line uh, distribution, uh, supply chain distributions, uh, the war as well. You know, the rail cars aren't where they need to be. The containers are in the wrong places. There aren't enough locomotives to move via rail through, through um, Azerbaijan and Georgia. And so that's why I was saying a few minutes ago, and we'll say more tomorrow, that now is the moment for uh, Professor Starr's, the north-south uh, transit routes that we, we've been talking about, that we lament, uh, the progress on which failed after the US uh, disastrously pulled out of Afghanistan. But it's not just talk, because as I'm telling you, there are people in this room right now who are, who are organizing this as a business proposition, as a commercial proposition that will make a lot of money. So I, I'm actually optimistic that, that these things are going to move forward. And then I'll just maybe on, on political Islam and, and democracy, yeah, that is a huge challenge. Huge challenge. And I mean, Fergana Valley is the place that has been a home to so much of that uh, uh, stirring and intensity. I'm ch choosing my words in a polite, careful way. And it's something Islam Karimov was terrified of, right? If you open up, then all of that genie is going to be let out of the bottle. But President Mirzoyoyev seems to be finding a way, right? His reforms seem to be quite thoroughgoing. We don't see a significant rise in, 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 in Islamist extremism uh, in, in mm. Uzbekistan right now. But I do think we see Moscow uh, trying to put gear in the sands of those reforms. Being mindful of the time and, and my willingness, obviously, to give all of you once again the floor. Luke, uh, let's go with you, and then we'll uh, move down. Thank right. you, Matthew. Um, on the first question about how we can take all of this to the next level, I think the most important, the U.S. engagement to the next level, I think the most important thing is to uh, Americans, Amer American policymakers should always remember that geography and history is going to play a role in the region, and China and Russia are always going to be part of the equation in the region. So we should never show up to the region uh, saying it's either us or them. We have to help the countries in the region balance their relations, and we also have to do it at a reasonable speed. I remember after Afghanistan, the, the, after Kabul fell, you already had policymakers, commentators in Washington saying we have to open up military bases in Central Asia, and only in America would we go from like no engagement to military bases with nothing in between <laughs> overnight. Um, so I think we have to be more realistic about that. The second to the uh, Afghan uh, gentleman, um, I, I, I personally think that. The, the road that brought us to this war in Ukraine first stopped in Kabul. That America's adversaries recognize dithering and weakness from the administration, uh, and they thought that this had always been in Putin's long-term planning, and he thought now's the right time. So, uh, but I don't think it's some grand design by U.S. Uh, strategy makers to test Russian military hardware or, or anything like that. Um, in terms of the third question about e uh, U.S. economic dominance, uh, I'm not an economist, but I do know enough to know that we have now implemented the largest in terms of size and scope set of economic sanctions against a single country in the history of economic sanctions, and we just don't know what the second and third order effects are going to be. Uh, so we have to stay on top of this and make sure that our interests are, are in the interests of our partners and allies uh, are, are protected. Um, in terms of how do I see, uh, you said it was an easy question, but then you asked, like, what's going to happen? <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, I think that we're going to just, uh, we, the West, will just muddle along. Uh, we'll be two or three steps behind what Russia's doing in Ukraine. We'll do just enough to make it look like we're doing something 
and this will lead to, uh, unless something changes, a, a bad outcome for, for the U.S. and sp specifically for U Ukrainians. And then finally about civil society groups. Uh, I, I think these are, these are very uh, contentious issues. Um, th these reforms and these changes have to happen at a pace that's co most comfortable with uh, the civil societies in question and the people in question. And I, I'm always loathe as an outsider to start, you know, putting demands on how you know, different groups in society should be allowed to or not allowed to engage with each other or with government. Thank, Thank you, you Luke. Uh, Sally? Well, I would agree that this was not a master plan because if it was, it was a disaster. <laughs> um, no, but I think I would like to leave on a, a sort of an upbeat note, which is that the catastrophic war in Ukraine has had some very positive unintended consequences. One is the alliance is as strong as it's ever been. Two, you've got countries who were not aligned who want to join the NATO alliance and be a part of the West. Three, a pipeline that was really going to solidify Russia's power, Nord Stream 2, we couldn't kill it, only Putin could, and it's dead. And yeah. I never would have predicted that it actually would be finished or that it could be killed by the Germans because of Putin's invasion. Uh, and three, Russia never wanted troops on the border. You've got more troops on the border than ever before solidifying, and so I think We've learned a lot. We've learned that Russia isn't as powerful. We've learned that there's a lot of mistakes being made, but that we're resilient and we need to work together uh, and we need to build on it. And I think Kamka region is one where we could really come together and fill in the, the holes. And so I think it's really a part of our job today to think about what that next step will be with the new playing field. And we have today and tomorrow to think about that <laughs> and, and uh, beyond, uh, Eric. Yeah, real quick. I mean, I, I do see the Ukraine war as a catastrophe, which in many respects, Putin's war began in the mid-2000s. And the political disunity within the NATO alliance, the failure of Europe and many Americans to take Putin's threat seriously, contributed, I think, to a snowball of, of, of smaller mistakes, which has led to a collapse of deterrence. The upside is, as Sally said, there has been a, galvan a political galvanization of the alliance uh, in the North Atlantic. And I think a lot, of, a lot of creative thinking about how to upgrade that alliance and to make it work better in the 21st century, not just in the North Atlantic, but a, a, around the world. On the de-dollarization issue, it's fascinating. I mean, what is sustaining Putin's regime and war effort today? It is the establishment of clearinghouses between China and Russia and between India and Russia and a number of other countries. I think that more and more you're going to see a whole variety of countries and regimes attempt to establish these safe spaces, if you will, in order to do prized you know, financial transactions. My own view is that if China were to begin to uh, promote renminbi clearinghouses with Belt and Road Initiative countries, that will be a frontal assault on the dollar as a reserve currency, and that would be a, a massive escalation in what you're seeing today. Um, and it's something that people are thinking about deeply, deeply. Um, uh, on, on energy, I would say this. I mean, we're now dusting off plans that emerged in the 1970s to supply Japan, which if you ask me is the most consequential bilateral alliance that the United States has. We're now dusting off plans from the 1970s to use Alaskan gas to uh, provide direct um, uh, uh, energy to Japan from North America, to integrate Japan into a North American energy economy. I would support that. I don't believe the United States has the output, um, um, the energy capacity to also support Europe at this time. And so there needs to be creative thinking with the Europeans and the Kamka region and the East Mediterranean countries to try to figure out how to, to uh, keep Europe warm this winter and beyond. Um, but yeah. yeah. I'll stop there. And that challenge will be great enough uh, yeah. for, for, for certain. Iskander, you'll get the final word. Yeah, thank you very much. On the soft opportunities, I think it's a very important question. I think uh, there are, in this room, there are many people who started their own business uh, and joint ventures in US. So I think you can kind of speak with them and you see that there is a, a growing number of young and mid-career entrepreneurs uh, in IT, in the business, uh, in different sectors who are actually working in, with the US. So I think a B2B style approach can be very much interesting in this respect. So it shouldn't be from the government to government level as well. 
uh, on the, the calculated strategy. Um, so we can speak about like it, it, it's possible and at the same time it's not. And uh, uh, it's a big question. It's, I, I think it's still up to discussion. But at the same time, uh, when you mentioned about that uh, for uh, Biden, President Biden, it's uh, very disastrous in terms of the inflation and uh, uh, the uh, midterm elections. In um, certainly, there is a big like another question: to what extent U.S. is going to support Ukraine if there is a question of uh, uh, inflation and the economic burden? The forty billion dollars support to Ukraine is being is now being questioned within the U.S. as well. And uh, if you take into account that uh, there is a lot of migrants, and uh, speaking about the alliance in the West on the Ukraine matter, if we speak, if you look at the uh, my, um, refugees uh, which went to Poland, for example, okay, for one year it's going to be like bearable, but if you take uh, like three years, what Poland's stance as on the refugees will be like in Turkey when you speak about the Syrian refugees. Uh, there was a big protest and outcry. So in this respect, we need to look at the medium, short-term, and long-term perspective. It can change as well, the narrative. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think medium, short-term, long-term perspective, all of those uh, are extremely necessary here. Kamka, geopolitics after Ukraine, what's desirable, what's possible? I, I think that this panel wonderfully uh, crafted uh, there is no one answer. I think that that's uh, for certain. Each region has its own set of challenges and perspectives, as do you, of course, as the Kamka region. But I think what this panel has uh, mastered so beautifully is built uh, greatly upon uh, Ambassador Bolton's intros and, and elaborated the many talking points that uh, he has given us. Matthew Breiser, Luke Coffey, Sally Painter, Eric Brown, and Skander Akelbaev. Thank you so much. This is your applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.